Welcome to the Nerd Party. Hello everyone, this is Sean Eastridge, host of Missing Frames, the podcast where we watch all the movies we should have seen by this point in our lives. I hope you've enjoyed my continuing coverage of the 2019 Atlanta Film Festival. Sadly, this is the last Atlanta Film Festival Between Takes episode I'll be releasing, at least until the next festival. So, I'd attended the red carpet premieres for four films, Lulu Wong's The Farewell, Joseph Cross's Summer Night, Joe Berlinger's Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile. Oh my gosh, try saying that five times fast. No, don't actually do it. Just, okay, let's move on. Finally, the last film was Dan Madison Savage and Britt Poulton's Them That Follow. I was able to get red carpet interviews with all these filmmakers, and I really wasn't sure what the best way to release them would be. They're so short, and I didn't want to bombard you guys with four or five three-minute episodes. So here's what I decided. We're going to do one big compilation, all the red carpet interviews, and one super cut. I'm going to give little introductions for each one so you're not confused. But you know what? Maybe you're just going to be confused no matter what. Maybe you are a confused person in general, so no matter what I do, it's not going to help. That's on you. So let's just kick things off with the festival's opening night presentation, The Farewell. I talked with the writer and director, Lulu Wong, about bringing this very personal story to the big screen. You can check out my full review on the Nerd Party blog, but let's get to that interview. Thank you for being here. Yes. So this is your second feature, yes. which is super exciting. Yes. And what kind of, what was the journey to get this movie made? Because I know it's a very personal story. Yeah. So what was that like trying to pitch that? And were there any struggles getting it to hear it to the big screen? Yeah, um, I mean, a lot. You know, it's, it's a, I would say, 100% Asian cast. Um, and it, there's a lot of Chinese in it, so it, there's a lot of subtitles. That was the film that I wanted to make. I wanted to make exactly the movie that um, you see. And I think that there was a, a, a producers who were interested initially, but they wanted a different movie. They wanted a bigger, broader movie. And they, they may have forced me to cast in a different way. And so it, was, it took some time before I found the right producers. And it was really because I did a story for This American Life. Um, and everybody heard it that um, I was able to find the right partners. Nice. And then I, I guess as far as finding the balance, because it's such a personal story and it sounds really amazing, how do you find the balance of telling a narrative and disconnecting yourself to be objective about the source material and being objective and telling the story as something that can appeal to an audience and trying to put on your director hat and your writer hat as opposed to kind of like, I experienced this, it's emotional to me, but making that broader in terms of appeal. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I never necessarily went about it thinking, how do I make this appeal to people? It was always like, um, what's the emotional core of every scene, you know? And um, what is the movie really about? I mean, the movie is about um, Lily, who uh, wants to have a cathartic goodbye, wants to say goodbye to her grandmother. And usually that means both people know that it's goodbye. Uh, but because her grandmother doesn't know, she's not really able to have a proper goodbye. And so then how does she... Um, you know, handle that. Like, how do you say goodbye? And I just kept asking that question as I was um, uh, directing the film and writing it as well, and and just saying because sometimes it isn't about a plot in a particular scene, but it's an emotional beat of um, yeah, how she's feeling when Grandma says, "I can't wait to throw you a wedding banquet," but you know, deep down she knows that that may, that will probably not happen. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm excited to watch it. Thank you. Next up is Summer Night. I chatted with the film's director, Joseph Cross, its producer, Audrey Tomasini, and one of its stars, Hayden Sito. If you aren't already aware, I did an extensive one-on-one -on -one interview with the three of them the following day, and it's tons of fun. You should definitely check that out. It's more of a deep dive into the film, so there's some spoilers, but, you know, no worries. That would be Between Takes, episode 0 0.8. But all right, let's get to the red carpet interview. Tell me a little bit about what attracted you to this, reading the script, like how did you get involved and what really appealed to you well, about being in this movie? I've always been a fan of coming of age dramas. Um, I, I think it's such a staple American, it's such an American film like about a bunch of friends that right. overcome a bunch of obstacles together. Um, it's something that's like so American, it's like the oldest American story to me. And um, I've done a lot of coming of age movies, so uh, naturally I was very drawn to it. I think um, coming of age movies really it helps give people who watch it like perspective on their own life, which is I think the mission statement of any film is to like 
have you walk out of there with some hope for your own self. You know, and another reason is that I got to play a character that was not very put together. Mm -hmm. I was extremely flawed. Um, It's also very fun. And it's not every day that an Asian American actor gets to play that type of character. Um, Like, he's kind of a screw up, which is which is uh, rarely portrayed. Uh, but we do exist. <laughs> so and, you're referring yeah, to yourself yeah, as yeah, exactly. So right. I'm proud that I get to uh, represent that. <laughs> you know, it was not easy, you know, being, you know, from a Chinese family saying that you want to be an actor. Right. You know, you're definitely a black sheep. Mm-hmm. And talk a little bit about working with Joe. And I know he's right there. So Yeah, Joe. Oh, Joe. Okay. Yeah. Well, he's yeah. such a great guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. He's awesome. <laughs> no, he's, he was extremely easy to work with. Um, he's like very much an actor's director. And because he's an actor himself. You know, he gets it, you know, like uh, when we have to take, like we have to take, we don't have to, you know, do it a million times. Like, yeah. Once he, He'll always ask me, do you feel good about that? I'm like, yes, I do. Oh, I wish I wish every director <laughs> asked me if I felt good about that instead of making me, you know, like jump higher, jump, jump Not just in acting, lower. but in life in general. Exactly. Do you feel good about yeah, that? Do you feel good about that? I'm like, yeah, I do, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> well, hey, I'm really excited to watch this movie. Thank you so much. Pleasure Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Yes. Enjoy. Joseph and Audrey, hey, how's it going? nice to meet you. I'm Sean Eastridge. Oh, We're the Nerd We're hanging out tomorrow, so we got, I got to try to ask you questions. I'm not going to ask you tomorrow. Right. Okay. But don't judge me if I okay. do, all right? Okay. So this is perfect. This is super exciting. It's your first movie. You're here. How are you, ex- take me step by step through how you're feeling right now, the emotions inside. I feel great. You yeah? Know, it's funny. I feel more relaxed than I think I have through this entire process because <laughs> we're, you know, we sold the film. We have distribution. Right. We know when we're coming out, you know, so it's really just we get to come full circle back to Atlanta and share the film with so many of the crew members who worked so hard on it and other people from the community and, you know we're really appreciative of this city and this state and uh, you know it just means a lot to go come full circle and, what about you how are you feeling everybody. I'm feeling Good? great yeah uh, not to repeat what Joe said but it's just really nice to be back here it's, it's kind of poetic we filmed it in like late fall and winter so it was kind of icy and cold seasons. and it was like grinding and just getting the movie made now we're like in spring and we can come celebrate so it's, it's really exciting to be back. It's perfect. And you've been in the industry for so long, since you were a kid. What what took so long to get to here, to directing? Yeah, you know, I think that I worked with, I think when I first started, like, acting, it mm. came from, like, making movies in the backyard, you know, that old right. thing everybody does that when they're eight, like, and then they go and make movies. And, and I think that, like, I think that I was working with really big filmmakers, like, really early on. Yeah. And that was probably made me, like, suppress this urge. It was intimidating mm. to some extent. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't know, I turned 30 and I was like, all right, you know, I've, I've wanted to do this, I think, sort of secretly for a long time, and I finally started to admit to myself how much I wanted to do it, and um, then we just got to work and made it happen, fortunately. Nice. And how did you get involved? Because I know you were saying your friend Jordan wrote the script. Yeah. Did he send it to you and you were like, this is it, this is what I have been looking yeah, I for? I mean, kind of, you know, we, he and I were exchanging material and I read it and I was like, you know, I think you have something really special here and this is pretty cool and I feel like, you know, you could make this on a budget and there's still a lot of heart here and then from there we spent like two years developing the script and then you just keep working on the script all the way through to, you know, all the way through the edit and work on the script all the time. So, and tell me a little bit about your influence and how that came through in the process yeah, I, of I think the it. script was really inspired by movies like American Graffiti and Days and Confused and Fast Times at Richmond High. So we just wanted to do something like that. We felt like nobody had done anything like that in a really long time and we wanted to, to give it a shot. And it was like about keeping the pace of those movies because there are, you know, you get a sense of the characters quickly yeah. but you're also moving through the story. So that's always the task when you're writing and yeah, developing challenge. something is to keep it moving and Absolutely. not, you know, get too lost in people because when you have a big ensemble cast it's really hard to get everyone's character across and we hope it does um, in the time that you have to then also tell the story so I think it was accomplished very well so well we'll chat more tomorrow thank you so much congratulations I'm so excited thank you thank you Now, this next one was a group effort with me and a couple other awesome critics at the festival. Joe Berlinger was in a big rush. There were tons of people out. Everyone loved Zac Efron. So it was me and these two other guys kind of bombarding him with questions. And again, this is in regards to his film, Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile, starring Zac Efron and Lily Collins. The film will be released on May 3rd on Netflix, but you can check out Mr. Berlinger's Ted Bundy Tapes documentary, in the meantime, it's also up on Netflix, and it's fantastic. All right, let's get to it. So why did you want to make this film? Well, I think the, uh, the lessons of Bundy can't be overstated, which is that people who you least expect, uh, uh, who you often...
often most trust often are the ones who do the most evil in life. Whether it's a priest who commits pedophilia and holds mass the next day, or a, a pharmaceutical CEO of Purdue Pharma who tells the sales force to repress the addictive nature of Oxycontin, that's compartmentalized evil as well. You know, and those guys all, I'm sure, have loving friends who think he's, they're wonderful people. Same thing with Bundy. Bundy was a charming, good-looking guy. And the first thing I did before I made this movie was I talked to both of my daughters, who are co college-age, very smart women who are in the prototypical Bundy victim age. And neither of them, nor their friends, really knew who Bundy was. And so I felt like telling the story using a teen heartthrob of that generation will send a message to younger people that, you know, just because somebody's in a position of trust, don't trust until you really know, you know? That, that's really why I made the film. So I'm Sean Eastridge with the Nerd Party. Oh, hey. I wanted to ask, I literally just finished the documentary right before I ran over oh, here cool. to do this, so that's awesome. But what did you want to explore narratively that you hadn't already explored in that documentary? Well, again, I think, um, I mean, Conversations with a Killer is like a deep dive into the mind of the killer. And it gives you an idea, you know, we don't spare any detail about how he operated and why he operated. With the movie, it's kind of the different half of the same coin or the you know it's like it's like the opposite it's like the psychology of seducing somebody by you know a psychopath making you think he's a good guy when in fact he's the opposite and Bundy uniquely conned as you'll see in the movie or maybe you saw in the doc he conned the judicial system I mean the amount of privileges and rights he got as a serial rapist and killer yeah is astounding to me. He conned the American media that kind of made him into a hero, uh, and he conned all the people around him. It took forever for him to capture. So, you know, Conversations with a Killer is a look at the at the mind and psychology of, of through his POV, and Extremely Wicked is looking at that psychology of seduction and how people can be deceived by even the people close to them. Of all the films you've done, especially films where it involves true crime, have you ever yourself been like scared or threatened or have had the hair rise up on the back of your neck? Yeah, many times. I've done, I've done a few things that have uh, made me a little nervous. Not like, you know, I made a film in the Amazon about oil pollution called Crude. And we were on the uh, Ecuadorian-Colombian border and it was not a very safe environment to be in. Uh, and we were exposing oil pollution by oil companies, and we felt a threat. So I wouldn't say I, I've, you know, been studying a serial killer. I, I, I haven't felt scared in that way. But some of the stuff I've done has put me in kind of a, not the safest situations. I mean, doing the Whitey Bulger film, I was interacting with a lot of Boston gangsters, and that, that gave me a little pause. But... Somehow they decided they liked me, so it was cool. What about the suspect in uh, Paradise Lost? Uh, uh, well, you know, the first Paradise Lost, uh, we actually got death th threats, and we were asked not to make the Jeez. film, but we, we kind of rebuffed those. Um, the second and third film, we didn't get any flack for them, but the first film, people did not want us to be in town. So, yeah, we've, you know, we've, had, we've had a few run-ins like that. You've got an incredible cast. Uh, talk about uh, Zach Efron at uh, Stead Bunny. Why did you want him? Um, well, look, I think Zach is an incredible actor. Um, and as a documentarian, I thought I wanted something real that I could grab onto and bring into the movie. And playing with Zach's real life persona as a real heartthrob for a certain demographic. That is, that is who Bundy was to a certain group of females. And the idea that I could take that and Zach was willing to turn that image on his head and part of his profile of who he is in real life, bring that into the movie, I thought was great for me. Um, now, if, if, if I didn't think he had the acting chops, you could dismiss that as a s stunt casting. But I think, I, I hope you'll see that he's done an amazing job and really inhabited the, the, uh, the, the role. Now, last but certainly not least, I spoke with Dan Madison Savage, a young filmmaker who, with his creative partner Britt Poulton, 
wrote and directed the upcoming film Them That Follow, which stars Olivia Coleman, Walton Goggins, and Alice Englert. Oh, God, I hope I said that right. I'm so sorry. Alice, if you hear this, I promise you're fantastic in the film and that my butchering of your last name is no reflection of your talents. So the crazy thing is this was Dan's first script and his first feature as a director. Uh, it It's insane. So we talk a little bit about that and how he got this cast together. It's pretty cool. Let's get to it. Oh my Sean, God, nice to so meet much. you. Thank Congratulations you. on this first feature. Yeah. So tell me what, what, what sparked it. Why this movie? Why did you decide to go with this as your first ever? Uh, you know, as my first, you know, truly, this is the first screenplay I ever wrote. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so... No big deal. So, you know, I have to be honest, I didn't necessarily expect to end up directing this mm. and going to Sundance and now being here at the Atlanta Film Festival, but sometimes life takes you by surprise. I really thought that I was the only one that was interested in Pentecostal snake handling, and it turns out that I was wrong. <laughs> um, you know, so really, you know, this is a film about faith and family and what happens when those two come into conflict, and I think that there's that at the end of the day, even though this is a very uh, extreme and at times bizarre a religious community a, everyone can relate to that everyone can relate to what happens you know when you might not agree with a family member gotcha. is this the first thing you've ever directed have you done shorts and things like that i did a short film yes okay so yes. what was what was it like making the leap to feature and this being such a huge thing we're already talking about the amazing cast and things like that just yes. talk a little bit about diving into that what was that like you know it was incredible to have a partner, you know. My dear friend, Britt, and I wrote this together. We directed it together. You know, I think we are very different creatives, but this is a project that we came together on, and, you know, two heads are better than one, and it was really through our friendship, you know, that we were able to laugh through the hardships, um, but also really create a safe environment for folks to experiment, to get things right, to get things wrong, and ultimately I think that's, whether you're making a short or they're making a feature, that's really what it's all about. Awesome. It's having fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thank yeah. you, Dan. Thank I'm you. excited to watch, oh, so thank you congratulations again. Sure. Yeah. All right, and that's that. A big thanks again to everyone who's tuned in to my Atlanta Film Festival coverage. I really appreciate all the kind comments, the support. I had a ton of fun, and I can't wait to do it again. So if you like what you've heard, be sure to subscribe to Missing Frames. I would love you forever. And hey, maybe give us a little five-star rating, too, on iTunes, if you want. That would be so beautiful. Take care, everybody. Thanks again.